Um, I welcome you to the second day uh, of the midterm conference of DECOM tools. So my name is uh, Markus Bentin. Um, I am the Dean of the Maritime Faculty of the University of Applied Science, M. Lehr, um, and one of the responsible persons of the DECOM tools project. So I just want to start today with a very short introduction into uh, the DECOM tools project and uh, giving um, a wrap up uh, of, of the first day. And then I will hand over uh, to uh, to the panel um, guided through by uh, Emmanuel. So DECOM tools uh, is a project funded by Interreg, North Sea Region Interreg. And um, uh, to, to keep it short, um, we, we have uh, 14 partners uh, around uh, the North Sea, um, so from Belgium, from Denmark, uh, from Scotland, from Norway, um, uh, from the Netherlands, and uh, uh, from, from Germany. <laughs> I hope that I had forget someone. <laughs> um, so there, I don't want to go into detail. So if, if you are interested in, in the partner itself, um, please look on, on the home page of Ecom Tools. Um, what is um, the main uh, the main target of the project? So the main target of the project is um, to reduce uh, the decommissioning cost by 20 percent, um, to reduce the, the decommissioning environmental footprint. Uh, this environmental footprint is uh, limited to CO2 emissions uh, by 25 percent. And then there might be the remark: um, what what is the basis if you are talking about percentage? You need to know what is the basis. Um, the basis uh, scenario for this is um, the reverse erection. So we believe um, that we can come up after four years with uh, smarter ideas than uh, reverse erection and uh, showing, proving um, that we can save their costs uh, and CO2. So that is uh, the, the main intention of, of, of the project itself. And um, yesterday we, we had already uh, three panels. Um, they were really interesting, and um, with a lot of uh, interesting presentations, inspiring in presentations. So we we walked through uh, the market of decommissioning, the legal framework, and uh, the decommissioning of oil and gas structures and, and subsea operations. Um, we touched uh, the topic of uh, recycling, circular economy, and the idea behind repowering and lifetime extension. We have learned that uh, there is a crucial difference between the concept of repowering and lifetime extension. And uh, while an extension can increase liability by five or up to 20 years, it depends a little bit on, on structure adjustment, repowering opens the chance to build large and more effective offshore wind turbines in already prepared areas. So that, that is the difference. Repowering, but repowering always goes hand in uh, hand in hand with decommissioning, and the challenge of decommissioning depends on various factors. This is what what we learned yesterday. Um, beginning with this, it is uh, favorable if the offshore wind turbines are in in good conditions and have gone through general maintenance regularly. For the decommission process itself, it is necessary that all parts of the offshore wind turbines are, are mapped out. Uh, here, special attention needs to be paid to the used hazards materials. There we had uh, one um, presenter coming from, from the shipbuilding industry, from the shipping industry, uh, talking about um, IHM lists. Um, we don't know this in, a, in the wind offshore industry. Um, touching the idea of a circular economy um, and uh, the overall approach of uh, sustainability. So offshore wind turbines components um, can be ranked, we learned, under different parameters like mass, uh, recycling rate, monetary value, climate impact, complexity and, and criticality. Um, also the market for for raw material influence uh, the circular economy. So if copper price is high, it is more attractive uh, to recycle copper. Also, we had lessons learned uh, from the decommissioning of oil and gas structures, um, especially handed in by the Norwegian colleagues. So um, they showed us um, uh, um, 
facilities where they decommissioning uh, um, offshore oil structures. Um, then some cutting tools were presented in, in that framework and seabed survey operations. Um, that is not really new territory we learned. Um, so that what offshore oil is, is already doing uh, in the offshore sector, they can switch easily into the offshore wind sector. Then new product designs were presented for um, uh, recently developed wind turbine parts are available. They may also be used as add-ons for lifetime extensions. Uh, some of these products are made of recycled material such as double recycled plastics which fits into the green thinking approach of, of the wind energy. So that was also an interesting approach. And overall, there's a great potential in the energy sector with growth opportunities in the offshore wind market. Today, 15% of the European wind power demand is met by wind energy with future pro prognosis increasing. So that I think needs to have in mind. And um, there was also one wisdom speech, uh, what you erect today, um, you have to, to commission tomorrow in 25 years. So. Um, as it is rising now erection, uh, it will also rise up in decommissioning um, with a time shift of 20 to 25 years. Europe is um, heading towards being a pioneer in the wind industry in all aspects, but it is need for uniformity uh, when it comes towards legal guidelines. So theoretically, we learned that there's an international law uh, it prevails, but practically what is most adhere to our national regulations and contracts and license of the wind park owners. So um, there might be a challenge um, to, to have more harmonized legalization uh, in Europe. Um, so up to now, uh, we don't have this. So that might be really a challenge. Yeah, so that was a rapid uh, uh, sub, uh, uh, wrap up uh, from, from yesterday. So I think uh, after the meeting, uh, you will find uh, the presentations which, which were allowed to, to hand out um, uh, on, on our uh, uh, homepage. And um, um, so you can follow up it afterwards also. So another remark, if you have uh, questions, um, uh, you have there, um, in the right corner, uh, um, um, something like a window where you can put questions on. And um, after uh, each panel, um, there is a Q&A &A, uh, section, and then all these questions are presented from the moderator to the to the panelists there, and then they are all answered. So please write your questions into this question module in this question window, and uh, then it's this is uh, then presented to the moderator. Yeah, today uh, we will have uh, three more panels, uh, starting with uh, port uh, and log logistics strategies, uh, followed by cutting, disassembly, and removal, and then ending with uh, the submarine power cables after lunch. So um, I wish you an inspiring day. And uh, I would now like to hand over uh, to to Emmanuel. Uh, he is the moderator of uh, the next uh, uh, panel uh, about um, the um, logistics port and logistics strategy. And Emmanuel is uh, from the port of Ostende, so he is an expert in logistics. So thank you, Marcus, and uh, good morning. So uh, my name is Emmanuel Timmermans, and I'm responsible for the uh, Repo offshore wind terminal in the port of Ostende. Um, and um, today I have the pleasure to introduce you uh, four specialists of the offshore uh, wind world. And the first speaker is Ivan Komasunak. He is analyst markets and wind energy technology at uh, Wind Europe. And uh, Ivan, I have a question for you. So we saw that in Germany, many wind farms could not be repowered due to the different environmental regulations. What would be the case for the existing offshore wind farms in Europe? Ivan, the floor is yours. 
thank you. Uh, well, it's 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 a good question. We still have to map it out. Uh, in, in Germany, we only really found this out, uh, uh, let's say, last year, uh, actually in 2019. That's actually half of the fleet could not be repowered. I'm going to talk about that in my presentation also a bit. Uh, but what we noticed uh, in offshore, at least, it's probably going to have less of an impact than, than what we had here in Germany. Uh, still, not all sites could will be repowered. That's that's something we, we have to be certain. Uh, but in the meantime, I can I can start with my presentation. Uh, yeah, well, this time it's uh, it's lessons learned from from onshore wind decommissioning. Uh, it it is it is quite quite similar uh, the two sectors, but uh, what what we notice is that uh, th there are some uh, some differentiations how to do the commissioning there, uh, and uh, in general that there is a lot of stuff that we can learn from from the process we've been doing in onshore wind decommissioning since it has been a bit more mature. Uh, on that front, much more companies involved, of course. Uh, for those who didn't see uh, last time uh, what Wind Europe is or, or who Wind Europe is, I'm representing the trade association based in Brussels, uh, more than 400 members uh, ranging from turbine manufacturers, developers, uh, ports such as the Port of Ostende. Uh, we have also Jan the Null here, we have uh, financial and legal services, research institutes. Uh, so universities are quite uh, uh, rep strongly represented as uh, DTU, for instance, and we have national wind or national renewable associations uh, in different countries that we collaborate on with. So why did we start this discussion on, on onshore decommissioning from, from our front? It was mainly due to the big volumes we saw coming to the end of life in, uh, in Europe. This is only onshore wind, and you'll see that uh, uh, there was a lot of capacity coming, uh, becoming this older than 15 years. Uh, in Europe, most of it being in Germany, where it was more than 16 gigawatts. Uh, yeah, that, that would be somewhere around, uh, I, I think only UK and Spain have, have more than 16 gigawatts installed. So that only those old assets would, could be the fourth largest fleet uh, in Europe. Uh, so indeed, it was uh, very important for us to take a look at it. Uh, it's, it's not only a German problem, we also see it in Denmark, who has on average the oldest fleet uh, in Europe, but also in Spain, uh, Italy, and Netherlands to, to a lesser degree. Uh, of course, onshore wind turbines were, were basically designed for 20 years. Uh, uh, we had, we mentioned yesterday that actually they've been performing a bit better. Uh, but then again, on the other side, you have uh, a feeding tariff that was lasting for 20 years. Uh, so, once that finished the feeding tariff is expired, uh, if the market price is too low, the wholesale market price and the operational costs are too too big, it doesn't make economic sense for an operator to continue running. So they either decommission or, or repower, or in some cases do some lifetime extension of their assets. Uh, the same story is going to be in, uh, in offshore wind. If you once your uh, let's say contract for difference uh, ends, uh, you will be looking into selling it on a wholesale market, but you will reassess if if you have higher, uh, uh, how, how, how much are your expenses on the operational front, uh, and then maybe you can sign a power purchase agreement and you have actually more of an income, but it's, it's a case on case basis and every, every wind farm is, is basically on its own to decide and does it make sense to continue operating or basically starts from scratch? We started with Germany. Uh, this is the map of, of, of German wind farms uh, that based, based on our member Aircon uh, assessed uh, what could be repowered. Uh, that's, that's the very few dots in green. Uh, the, the red ones are the ones that could not be repowered. We mentioned the issues why it's changing environmental impact uh, assessments, much stricter uh, rules nowadays. We have larger turbines uh, and since the setback distance or the distance between dwellings and, and wind turbines is a correlation of of the height of a turbine uh, we are also due to let's say our own uh, improvement in size we're also a bit suffering of, of finding enough uh, good locations in germany uh, there could be of, of course there, we have those yellow dots here of, of places we could repower that's 
something we still need to, to, to work on a bit. Uh, but yeah, the, for now it's it's a bit worrying on the on the onshore front that not everything could be repowered. Uh, we we hoped everything could be repowered that, so that we can increase the capacity quite a lot of, of that old fleet. I mentioned more than 16 gigawatts are all over 15 years. And based on our analysis of repowering projects, we noticed that on average a wind farm onshore has a third fewer turbines. Uh, twice the capacity, more or less, uh, and turbines are, are two thirds uh, larger. Uh, so you, you see this trend, we have fewer turbines, they're larger, same thing we're going to see in offshore wind. Um, in offshore, of course, it's, it's the layout is going to be a bit different. In, in onshore wind, actually, in Europe, the, they don't consist of many wind turbines. Uh, the wind farms are, are usually in a, in a line distribution, so uh, you have to worry a bit less about turbulence when you put uh, a bigger bigger turbine on it. Uh, with offshore, it's going to be a bit more complex, but I, I think our developers uh, can solve that. Now, when we looked at, at what the future brings for, for repowering lifetime extension, uh, we actually think, you know, in our latest outlook, this was a bit before COVID, uh, that most of it will, will just continue running after 20 years. Uh, or get some lifetime extension, uh, more than three quarters. Uh, this green part, fully decommissioned, those are projects that uh, will just be decommissioned and left as, as a green field. And the capacity under repowering the light blue uh, is the small part that, that's going to be decommissioned and then be repowered. This is, this is uh, for, for all Europe here. As you can see, yeah, the repowering isn't playing that, that big of a role right now. Of course, some of this a big blue part could end up being repowered later in the future. Uh, but for now, when they reach 20 years of age, uh, we still see quite a lot of, of uh, operational assets. Uh, now, what we have been doing as Wind Europe is, is uh, we noticed that in the process of decommissioning, uh, decommissioning costs could, could go down or they could go up, depending on uh, depending on, on uh, let's say, if, if uh, operators try to uh, get somehow additional costs uh, due to uh, new legislations in different countries. The more different legislations you have in different countries, uh, you have less standardized way of doing it. Uh, it's going to end up usually costing more uh, for operators to take down uh, their, their wind farm. Uh, so we saw, for instance, in Germany that there was a uh, discussion on, on uh, building, on creating uh, the inspec uh, for, for decommissioning. And we saw that different countries were thinking about it. So we as a sector, we, we sat down and pulled all the, all the big players in, in onshore wind and basically worked more than a year uh, on, on creating a guidance document on decommissioning of wind turbines, of onshore wind turbines uh, only, uh, where in the 60-page document, uh, we try to, let's say, uh, descriptively show different options that are available out there, and we submitted it to the IEC uh, as a new work uh, proposal under the Dash 28 for the uh, decommissioning and preparation for recycling. That's that's under which name it's going to go, and it's currently submitted to the IEC. It's uh, pending voting now to see what what happens later. What it means is basically in, in two years it could become a technical specification, which is basically a standard. Uh, so we would have a European standard for onshore decommissioning. And uh, uh, let's say each country can refer to that, and uh, it, it could lower the cost of, the, of decommissioning. About the guidance document itself, it's, it's yeah, non-prescriptive. It it's, uh, has a very big audience, so a lot of different uh, people can understand it, ranging from policymakers, operators, uh, bankers, it's it's relatively easy to read, uh, but it's it's mostly aimed at policymakers and operators, uh, so that they can really uh, see what to uh, of let's say the things they have to do in in, in their decommissioning project. Uh, we do once a year a, a seminar on end of life issues, uh, usually in November, uh, and then that's when we published uh, this one. Uh, so of course there was. Uh, a lot of work put here into, into onshore wind. Uh, we have all these questions, uh, what, when are we going to do offshore wind? But let's say one step at a time. Uh, this was for now much more uh, crucial, so we wanted to really uh, nail this down and, and do the onshore part as, as, as good as possible. Uh, in terms of contributions, how it looked, uh, yeah, you'll see a lot of familiar uh, 
players here. Uh, it was the task force itself, which was chaired by VDMA, the German uh, association. Uh, and then in there, we had developers, operators, uh, turbo manufacturers, uh, companies dealing with lifetime extensions such as UL. Uh, so it was a very big pool, and of course, national association. So it was a very big pool of, of uh, companies and stakeholders participating in, in the creation of this 60 pager. Uh, just to go a bit through it, uh, we had five main topics that we wanted to address. We, we, took, uh, we took a look at the regulations in, in the key countries that we identified for onshore wind uh, uh, decommissioning. So France, Denmark, Germany, Italy, Netherlands, Spain, the UK. Uh, and then after basically seeing how much it differs between different countries, we uh, presented the actual decommissioning plan that's, uh, that one of our members is, uh, uh, is using on, uh, on some projects in Germany. So it's very specific for Germany, tailor-made there. You have all the different uh, uh, requirements you have to have in the in decommissioning plan. Uh, we do also uh, have a communication plan within it, uh, especially in onshore wind. It was very crucial that, that we involve uh, local stakeholders as much as possible uh, because it's it's not a like, nice thing when you get woken up by explosion that, that takes down a, a wind turbine. Of course, we we in our document we say we're not for for the measures uh, of taking down turbines with explosions, but but sometimes for the foundation uh, it, it needs to be done. So it's crucial to to actually talk to, to every stakeholder that uh, was involved, at least in onshore wind. Uh, probably it, it will have uh, also in offshore wind, wind, but to a lesser degree. And we focus quite a lot on health and safety throughout the whole document. It's absolutely crucial to, to avoid any casualties and, and to do it in the most uh, safe uh, way for not only the environment, but also for, for the people working there. That's also a crucial thing that's going to be uh, for offshore wind. We're taking a look at dismantling and, and basically presented uh, of different ways of, of doing the assembly, cutting and separating, and how to load and transport uh, all the waste that, that occurs from uh, from the wind turbine. Uh, this is probably what's going to differ the most from uh, from offshore wind in our document. But then uh, we, we also have a separate section on resource management where we basically map out every material that's, uh, that's uh, in a wind turbine. Uh, so we don't really write uh, what's the recycling option for, for all of them, but we do specify uh, which ones are easily recyclable, such as uh, uh, concrete or, or iron, and we do give some options for, for composites from the blades, but of course that's a different topic. This is Think of this as, as preparation for recycling, so everything you do before recycling. And then lastly, we talk about site restoration uh, and, and different things you need to do in order to make the site basically greenfield, so which means you have to just give it back to to the same same site you you got it once you once you start developing the the project. And then in short, what uh, what what we concluded from that is that we have very different decommissioning rules uh, uh, for and dismantling rules across Europe. Uh, that we need a communication plan that's absolutely crucial. Health and safety issues top priorities. Uh, uh, and at least in the case of onshore wind, this, the decommissioned sites should be returned to a greenfield unless we have a repowering project uh, happening immediately. Uh, so you'll see that it's, it's quite, uh, I hope it, it opened some, some questions, some ideas for, for offshore wind. A lot of stuff is similar, especially health and safety, especially uh, the different rules and try to make the same rules, as, at least in the North Seas. Uh, and now on the part of how much. Uh, how much of a wind turbine should be decommissioned, how much should be left uh, uh, in the waters. That's, that's I think, a separate discussion, which is we, we opened a bit yesterday, uh, but I think we as a sector need to have it. Uh, so besides this, this activity in, in onshore wind, uh, we've been actually a bit involved on offshore with, with Ore Catapult. They're trying to do a very similar thing of creating an international standard for offshore wind decommissioning, uh, but that just kicked off. Uh, in, in Q4 of 2020, so it's also going to take some time uh, until this reaches its end. So thank you. I hope uh, I hope I hope created some some additional questions in your head, and if you had any, looking forward uh, to receive them later on. A very nice presentation, Ivan, and thank you very much. Thank you very much.
and hopefully we will have soon a common general EU um, document or uh, regulation uh, for uh, decommissioning. So thank you. So my next speaker is uh, my colleague, uh, Mr. Wim uh, Stubbe. Wim is a business development manager at the port of Ostende. Um, Wim, uh, hello. Um, Wim, your title of the presentation is also a question. So the port and decommissioning, a necessary evil or a source of added value? Um, and thank you very much, Emmanuel, for presenting this. I'm very happy with the previous speaker, and it's good to hear that uh, Wind Europe is investing in consultancy work, external consultancy, to line up some of the questions that also the ports are confronted with. So thank you very much, Ivan, for this information. I'm happy to hear that. So I hope that we can uh, have a further discussion on that. Uh, although uh, it's an important topic coming on the on the plate of the ports, I think um, this might be an element that you can suggest to the people of uh, the ports platform, Mattia and Lisa, to put it on the agenda. Um, <clears throat> as to my presentation, thank you very much, Emmanuel. As uh, already mentioned, we are colleagues. We are work both working in a small uh, port on the North Sea coast called Ostende. Um, in my presentation, I will give you a first and short introduction to the Port of Ostende and Rebo Terminal. Uh, then I will have a little wink to the offshore decommissioning market. And then, uh, based upon the different steps of decommissioning, uh, I would like to present the different elements that uh, a smaller port or a medium-sized port can take uh, in hands during the decommissioning uh, work, and more precisely what Rebo Terminal and uh, Port of Ostende can do in these matters. So it's a more pragmatic and very practical uh, presentation. No, uh, let's say, no high principles will be uh, put on the um, on the plate here, although I'm, I'm sitting in the middle of the church. Um, so Port of Ostende and Rebo. Uh, Port of Ostende is a small, uh, North Sea port. Um, it's about seven kilometers long and it has a multifunctional uh, operation. Um, if, we, if I make a short description of the port of Ostende, uh, the outer port is definitely focusing on the blue industry and the offshore industry. Um, the inner port is, has a very clear focus on, uh, let's say, Seveso related uh, activities and uh, circular economy. Um, research and development is an issue at the port of Ostende. Um, together with the University of Ghent and other uh, university colleges, um, we try to implement some of the activities within the blue industry. Um, to show this, we have, uh, I mean, as a kind of an example, there is a test facility at sea called the Blue Accelerator that will be opened now these weeks, um, even under COVID conditions. And uh, in the inner port, we have the maritime wave and towing tank whereby um, several testings for offshore installations and shipping can be organized. <clears throat> Other elements of uh, research and development are definitely the issue of uh, storage and use of hydrogen in shipping and uh, the activities related to marine drones. Um, this will become also more and more important in our activity field for the next years. So let's say that we are not a traditional uh, box-to-box -box port uh, where boxes are moved from one side of the world to the other side of the world but we try to have a more uh, multifunctional approach considering the size of the port that we have. The Rebo terminal is the heavyweight terminal at the port of Ostende and is situated in the outer port. Um, where do we have uh, the decommissioning activity in our port activities? As you can see here uh, we have a kind of a Greek temple, so we go back in history, um, whereby five uh, uh, core activities have been uh, identified for the Port of Ostende. And one of the issues that is definitely written down in the strategy is decommissioning and circular economy, next to the other more traditional logistic operations and the blue industry. Um, as mentioned, the Rebo terminal is our heavyweight terminal. It's a terminal which is, has a site of 15 uh, hectares and has been especially used in the recent years, and I speak about recent years, uh, the last 10 years for the installation of uh, inst 
of offshore uh, wind parks at sea, especially the Belgian sex section. Um, next to the installation of offshore wind farms, uh, we have also been involved in other activities like uh, the building and the construction of substations um, or the finishing touch of uh, substations. So there is more to be handled in the offshore business than purely the wind farms. This is a short introduction about the ports and uh, the rebo terminal. Um, if we go to the opportunity of decommissioning in the Belgian waters and let's say the Belgian slash English slash French slash uh, Dutch waters, uh, knowing that the Belgian coast is only uh, um, as big as one uh, shoe of um, um, uh, a big giant, um, I mean, with a coast of 60 kilometers, it's clear that we are uh, squeezed in between uh, the activities of the offshore wind industry. Uh, in Netherlands, France and England. So we keep an eye open for what's happening uh, in the neighborhood countries. Um, if we look to the European markets, I think this has been already presented in other presentations yesterday. So um, I think there you have a good overview of uh, um, the volumes that are on the table now today, knowing that there's um, are about 4,600 wind operating wind turbines in the North Sea today. Um, so this gives you an example of uh, what is the volume of the overall uh, European slash North Sea market uh, in as to decommissioning. Um, if we look to the Belgian situation and uh, the opportunity there, here see you the here you see the the, the marine spatial plan of the Belgian coast, whereby the different uh, functions are identified uh, by the Belgian government. And um, if we look to the, the activities in the offshore business, then we see, of course, the phase one of the Belgian offshore wind farms, which has been finalized last year in 2020, in November 2020, with the installation and the construction of the CMATE project. And next to that, next door, uh, back to back, we have the, the Dutch uh, Zeeland uh, wind farms, uh, which are also in the full construction, the Borsele wind parks. And then we have, of course, uh, the French wind parks, which uh, where the government, uh, <coughs> excuse me, is still thinking where to put the offshore wind turbines and how to put the offshore wind turbines and is in full negotiation with the French fishermen, uh, how to do and what to do and when to do. Um, so whatever, never, never mind, if you look to the map, uh, you see also the second phase of the Belgian wind parks, which should be um, started to be constructed in 2027. Um, I think you have a clear overview on the very short coastline of Belgium and the different uh, um, wind parks that need decommissioning within 15 slash 20 years. If we would cross the, the North Sea uh, Channel area, about 88 sea miles further, then we end up in the English um, uh, wind farms with the, um, the Ramsgate uh, wind farm and the London Array wind farm, which are a little bit further on. So there is definitely something going on in this part of the North Sea. Um, conclusion, there is an opportunity for the Port of Ostende to consider the activity of uh, decommissioning of wind turbines. If we have a more detailed analysis of the different wind farms on the Belgian, uh, which has been built during the first phase of the Belgian wind industry, offshore wind industry, uh, then you have a clear overview of uh, the numbers and the figures um, in function of the timetable. So if we look um, in 2030, and if we consider that uh, wind turbines, considering the harsh North Sea conditions, can only live for about 20 years, then you see that uh, in 2030 already 61 wind turbines should be taken into consideration for decommissioning. Um, go with, do we go five years further? Then we already have an, an, uh, a kind of 182 wind turbines which are ready for decommissioning. So, um, and if we really close down the, the first phase of the Belgian wind uh, uh, industry, offshore wind industry, then in 2040, the whole uh, 399 wind turbines should be, let's say, um, decommissioned. So. Not today, but within a few years, it's clear that uh, there is a market for um, decommissioning of the Belgian wind turbines uh, at sea. Um, this is the market condition. Conclusion, there is definitely an opportunity um, with, let's say, a clear starting point in 2030. And therefore, I think it's important that um, as a port, which is a kind of a static element in the industry, 
um, starts to prepare itself in this kind of um, matters. Um, this is probably an, a scheme that you have seen already 25 times yesterday, an overview of the different steps that need to be considered uh, if you are thinking about the process of decommissioning um, at sea and on land. Um, <clears throat> the idea now is to have a look where the port of Ostende is, can play a role in all each of these kind of uh, uh, steps that need to be taken in order to bring decommissioning of offshore wind turbines to a good and positive and cost efficient and energy efficient and CO2 friendly and um, happy ending. Um, logistics at sea, um, as mentioned in this chapter of the, the presentation, we will investigate the, let's say, the cards that the Port of Ostende can play in this field of uh, decommissioning. So if we consider the first step, which is decommissioning at sea, and logistics at sea, there is definitely a kind of a track record that can be presented um, by the Port of Ostende, uh, which has been built up during the phase of the installation of the offshore wind turbines. So there you can see that uh, several vessels and several different types of vessels have been uh, working at the Port of Ostende um, in full um, compliance with health and safety regulations and in full compliance with the um, let's say the, the charter of the wind park managers in order to realize the building and the construction of the offshore wind farms in time and in a, in a cost efficient way. Um, important in this matter is definitely the port accessibility. Um, for the commissioning, just like for uh, installation uh, and direct port accessibility will have major importance. Um, the fact that you don't have to pass locks in order to bring your pieces from and on land uh, is a major um, asset and is uh, rather important in order not to lose time and uh, uh, money on the charting of different vessels. Um, we have also direct connection to different modes of transport. Um, the Port of Ascend is well uh, developed in an intermodal way. Uh, having inland waterways, uh, airport, insofar this this would be necessary, um, uh, motorways and other elements uh, within the port. Um, this gives you a better overview of the position of the Rebo terminal in relation to the port accessibility. Um, today um, you see the two uh, breakwaters of the of the port, um, whereby that uh, the plans are on the table now also to see where we can strengthen our position in the offshore markets uh, by building new uh, facilities uh, within the port area uh, for the offshore installation and decommissioning activity. So you see the Rebo terminal where you have the blue um, uh, line of uh, the swing circle of 300 meters. Um, so you can see that the access is really straight on, straight off. Um, no locks, no bridges, um, and there is an absolute priority for installation slash decommissioning vessels um, in the port of Ostende. Um, port accessibility is definitely an issue, intermodality as well. Um, here you see a clear uh, link between the different modes um, that are present in the port. As mentioned, um, the Rebo terminal is the heart of the matter in the offshore wind industry within the port of Ostende. Um, it is the place to be to organize your activities. Um, um, and therefore, several investments have been made in the past. And of course, we are absolutely open also to see uh, within the sphere of decommissioning if extra investments need to be made. Um, the Rebo terminal is equipped with a heavy load term uh, terminal where you can handle up to 20 tons per square meter, which is uh, still quite unique in the Belgian context. Um, there is a heavy load key of 800 meters. The seabed has been reinforced in front of the, of the heavy load key. And um, it is, of course, an, uh, a paved area whereby that uh, several operations can be organized uh, from a logistic point. Next to that, uh, next to the heavy load key, we have also the heavy load pontoon, um, where um, weights of 650 tons in tidal conditions, and we have a tidal condition of five meters approximately at the port of Ostende, so where uh, Rural ships can be loaded and unloaded with heavy project cargo up to 650 tons on the pontoon, which you can see in the middle of the Rebo terminal. Here you have a better view where the Rotravente is 
uh, unloading itself um, with SPMTs uh, on the pontoon so that um, all the different elements for the installation of the wind parks could be established. Logistic at sea, logistic at port. Um, at the port of Ostend, we have definitely taken the, the option not to invest ourselves in trains, but to search together with the, the project managers and the, the wind park managers uh, for the best option, the best solutions um, for handling, uh, in this case, the installation operations within the port of Ostend at the Rebo terminal. So there is no, uh, we are not married with one of the companies that you see here on the screen. Um, we will not marry, uh, for sure. We prefer to, as we are in the middle of a church, um, we prefer to stay, uh, let's say, uh, single. And uh, um, we are open for any discussion with uh, different partners, can, with different parties, which can give uh, the best added value for the logistic operations in the port. Um, this brings us, of course, to the the last step, or let's say one of the last steps in this kind of operation, which is definitely the recycling. Um, as mentioned in the beginning of my presentation, uh, the outer port is really focusing on the offshore um, energy industry and on the blue industry. The inner port is definitely focusing on circular economy, which is going beyond recycling. Um, if you look here on the map on the right side, you see the different the distance between the outer port and the inner port is about three kilometers. Uh, whereby that the pieces can be transported over by barges um, over the canal uh, to the inner port. The inner port is connected to the, let's say, the Belgian and European waterway system. Um, so it's linked, it's linking Ostende to Ghent, further on to Antwerp, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So um, this is a situation. So as you can see, for handling the parts which are the result of dismantling, um, the different uh let's say handling uh companies are extremely close to where the decommissioning uh can be uh, operated um to be more concrete what kind of companies are working and uh investing in the port of uh, osanda today in the inner port we have uh, im recycling which is definitely focusing on let's say the more uh, ferro and non ferro uh, parts of uh, the um, offshore industry um, of course they have their other activities today and they are uh, focusing on definitely they have developed their own technologies in order to make uh, let's say a quite pure process of um, dismantling different metal pieces then we have next to that uh, Renacci, Renacci which is a young uh, enterprise which is focusing on the recycling and the reuse of plastics and polyester um, they're working on their proper innovation projects amongst other on the polyester blades um, this is a process which has been put in 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 line now um, together with this company uh, and the port and the rebo um, so we are making some first tests now to see what's going on and how we can work on that um, then we have uh, like a company like topmix which is really taking care of um, recycling and reuse of uh, concrete and building materials um, Close to the airport, we have uh, AeroCircular, which is taking care of not only of aircraft um, electronics or airplane electronics, but also all kinds of electronics which can be revalorized, re etc. Then we have also uh, West Recycle, which is taking care of mineral waste. And then I would say there are uh, other elements like Bio, Storm, and Docklands, which can be of uh, added value in this kind of um, operation of uh, circular economy. So, um, as mentioned, we are as Rebo and uh, Ostend, Port of Ostend are a small port at the North Sea, southern North Sea coast. Um, but nevertheless, uh, we, even in times of COVID, we like to have uh, um, nice family parties. And as you can see here, this is the family uh, which is uh, living um, at the Port of Ostend, dealing with different operations in offshore industry. Um, I call this like the village of Asterix and Oblix. These people have a quite close interaction between themselves. So there is a full package of services which is available within the Port of Ostende for anyone who is willing to um, work on uh, boat installation, maintenance and uh, decommissioning of offshore wind farms and offshore wind 
uh, or offer energy, renewable energy installations. Um, then I only can thank you very much and welcome you at the future visit at the Port of Ostende. Uh, even in these times, uh, difficult times, we keep on working um, and we keep trying to take care of our uh, customers uh, as much as we can. So please feel free if you feel the need to uh, take some fresh sea air. You're very much welcome at the Port of Ostende and we can give you, uh, we can guide you, both Emmanuel and myself, um, to make a visit to the different uh, elements that you have seen at the Port of Ostende. Thank you very much for your attention. I will leave the church now and I give my word back to Emmanuel, who is uh, going to present the next speaker. Thank you. Thank you very much, Wim, for this uh, very nice presentation, which looks a little bit familiar to me. Uh, well done. <laughs> very good. <laughs> I just want to mention, so if you have questions during the presentations, uh, please use the queue button on the uh, right side uh, of your screen. Uh, and now we go over to the next speaker. The next speaker is from Denmark. Uh, it's Mr. Thijs Gisselbeck. He's COO, Chief Operation Officer at the Port of Rena. Hi, Thijs. I see that you are there. Um, how are you? Good? I should be. Hopefully okay. you can hear me. Okay, nice. Thanks. I, uh, I thank you for, uh, for your presence. Uh, I have also a question for you. Yeah? So with the increasing of offshore wind market uh, for new installations, why does your port, uh, the port of Grana, focus on decommissioning? Thanks, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, we see this uh, transfer of knowledge between uh, uh, our segments and other industries as a strong starting point in and also for that in decommissioning itself. Um, so we have knowledge for installation, we have knowledge in the wind industry, we have knowledge in recycling of materials and, and decommissioning of vessels. So we see a benefit of not starting uh, from scratch when we are talking about the decommissioning of offshore wind turbines. Um, and that is, of course, also why we are part of this EU project and why we are also looking into uh, oil and gas industry decommissioning and other activities, because we need to gather a lot of knowledge from a lot of industries to industrialize the, the offshore decommissioning activities in wind. You have given a short introduction to me and uh, I started in uh, in Port of Greno, uh, situated uh, 60 kilometers from, from Aarhus, the big uh, offshore wind capital at least uh, have a lot of uh, of history within the offshore wind and wind in itself and Port of Greno is, is situated uh, in an area with a long history of uh, of wind itself. A lot of companies have started nearby Port of Greno and today a lot of service providers within the wind industry are still situated with, uh, with their uh, office facilities around Aarhus or at, around the port of Greno. Um, we at Port of Greno have just entered into a new strategy. Uh, our former strategy uh, from 2016 to 2020 has just ended. Uh, we uh, had a lot of success within the focus area we, uh, we, we brought in in 2016. And from from now on and the next five years, we will be focusing more or less on the same. We have added a few things and and refined our strategy, but uh, we want to be a, a part of partnership for Green World 2025. Um, we have made a full commercial strategy that also includes our CSR policy and our UN 17 uh, global goals are incorporated in in our full 
strategy. So it's not a part of having a lot of different strategies which we need to look into each time we take a decision. We have one strategy that covers everything and we think that is a strength. Um, as you can see, we have knowledge and we are focusing on wind itself. We have done uh, offshore wind for, for decades and we have uh, we have a long history within offshore wind. Uh, energy and innovation is more uh, actually the DECOM tools project is part of our energy and innovation uh, segment. We want to use a lot of resources on figuring out how the future will be. And by that we, uh, we do a lot of research and when it materializes, when we will put these uh, these uh, um, these projects into, we will materialize it to others of our strategies, focus strategy areas. Stacking and maintenance is is a success for us. We have a lot of wind and oil and gas vessels uh, stacked at the port, and we have a strong uh, service network that are able to maintain them when they are ready for their new job. Uh, bulk is our bread and butter. We have done that for ages and we handle most bulk types in the port. Uh, ferries and shipping lines is, uh, is the few good shipping lines we have in the port with regular service. And then we have a ferry to, to Sweden as well. Recycling waste management is part of where we want to focus and where we want to transfer a lot of knowledge into uh, recycling of wind because we have a long history and some good partners at the port that knows about recycling itself and we want to transfer their knowledge onto this next next area of, of the wind project cargo. We can handle heavy equipment, the same with wind and uh, we have a lot of material handling uh, machines at the port that we own ourselves and our good partners owns that that makes it possible to uh, to handle a lot of project cargo and then of course we are a landlord like Ostende uh, we uh, rent out areas we rent out buildings we rent out people and and actually also material handling machines um, but altogether, this is our focus areas for the next five years. And within these areas, we see a lot of knowledge sharing between them. And most of our clients, they actually fit into mo more than just one of the uh, these areas. And as you will see now, we have made two strategy houses. Uh, they are combined and they do not work individually. Um, the first one I showed you just before is more our commercial strategy, but it is linked totally to our sustainable strategy where we have uh, um, made clear goals of what we will uh, achieve the next five years. We have business sustainability where we are looking towards our clients, our good users of the port, and then our organizational strategy sustainability where we are looking into health and, uh, and other of, uh, of the UN global goals. And one of the most important statements I would say is that we have taken the decision to use 10% of the uh, of the uh, port's profit each year to a sustainable transition so that we can take a, a more that so that we don't need to look into economy and the the last digit of the cost when we uh, when we upgrade our equipment and and with when we take an investment decision for instance we have uh, bought a, a fully um, electric uh, port crane, uh, which we have used several million Danish kroner on converting. So uh, we are looking forward to, uh, to, to combine these two strategies so that we can, uh, so we can help these, uh, uh, these 
challenges we have as a society going forward. And by that, we are not a clean port, you could say. We're not a business. Our business is not containers and row row cargo itself. So it's not the uh, traditional port operation you would see in Port of Grano. We are used to have uh, dirt and noisy uh, operations, but we need to do it most uh, uh, environmental friendly as possible and best practice. So that's our goal itself, because a lot of port activity is actually um, not the clean part of, uh, of other industries. We come, as I say, from a pre-assembly uh, facility where we have done uh, some of the offshore installations here in Denmark. And the knowledge from that and the knowledge from ship recycling is what we want to transfer together with the recycling facilities at Port of Greno. We want to transfer the knowledge to this industry of, of recycling offshore wind turbines. We, we are able to handle the components. We are used to have large areas for, for, for storage. So we, we want to, to be better uh, utilization of our facilities. Then we want to, to, to bring in recycling as well. Um, we see as a, as part of Fosende, we see this uh, operation of we have an offshore part of the work of the supply chain that that we need to interact with uh, more than we have seen before because it is bigger vessels, it is uh, larger components, it is a more complicated um, supply chain than before. And we need to accommodate that in our infrastructure. We need to be able to look abroad, look five years, 10 years, and 15 years when we do investments. And by that, we need to be closer to the uh, to the industries than we needed to uh, before. Uh, we are, of course, also looking into having a, a bright future in the CatGat area where we are situated. Uh, with uh, seven uh, larger offshore projects being commissioned within the next 10 years, we look at, uh, at uh, other ports in the area that also are focusing on, on the same issues as, and, and the same industries as we do. We see a huge infrastructure project like the Femon Belt, uh, which is a tunnel between Norway, uh, between Denmark and Germany being built at the same time within the next 10 years. So a lot of infrastructure projects in our area the next 10 years will at least make it difficult to accommodate everything uh, within the ports that have the ability today. So, so we are looking into a future where port infrastructure will be a limited uh, capacity. Um, but we see this offshore wind farm going into a port. We need to be a, a buffer zone between the uh, the offshore decommissioning. Parts will come into the port. We don't know exactly the best practice of that if it is if it will be a full components as we see from pre-assembly, or it will be smaller components due to uh, the cutting and so on offshore. But we will see ourselves as a buffer zone where we need to have a lot of land, a lot of handling equipment to be able to to head the cargo. And then we see a flow of materials going into various uh, uh, recycling processes. Of course, the easy part is the tower because it's steel. Uh, and steel is a well-known material to recycle. The rotor is difficult because of the uh, composite materials. And then the cell is the, uh, um, I would say it's it's also quite complicated in, in, in matter of hours needs to be the use to, to decommissioning uh, such a component because there are a lot of different materials in an cell, so a lot of different 
companies actually have an interest in the nacelle. Um, one thing is, of course, the, the, the recycling itself, but we are also looking into reuse. Um, we are looking into, uh, do we need to have a storage site nearby which can accommodate some of the best components that might be able to be reselled for, for uh, as spare parts to other projects. So we are looking into both the recycling, but also the reuse part. Um, what we are looking into is a complicated stakeholder management i would say right now we are focusing very much on legislation uh, we are focusing very much on the environmental aspects the certificates the politicians decision logistics facilities it's just to mention a few un global goals is also uh, 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 one of the areas where where we might see some changes in how we do it uh, and all comes back to the investments that either we as a port do in infrastructure, but also our good clients needs to to uh, to invest in new facilities, new ways to recycle or reuse these components. But right now, in the starting phase of offshore wind decommissioning, the environmental, the politicians decisions, the legislation is is gray areas where we are uncertain about the decision on we, we would like eu to take a decision on how is this done best practice how is this done environmental friendly uh, set some guidelines because else we would see uh, we we are afraid that we would see a, a country by country decision about how is the seabed uh, uh, left after decommissioning of offshore wind. So we don't know about marine growth. Can we transfer that from one country to another country and all that? So uh, a guiding book from EU would be a big help to, for us as one of the last parts in the supply chain to do our investments. Uh, but, but it is a challenge uh, that we also use this uh, DECOM tools project to, to enlighten. I want to tell I want to show you two cases that is something that we want to transfer some of the knowledge within these two uh, cases to offshore wind decommissioning. We have done onshore we are doing onshore decommissioning today. It is not that much more difficult to do the offshore but it's another supply chain the logistics supply chain is different and maybe also the, some of the reuse supply chain will be different. But the Faunus re Ship Recycling is, uh, is a company at the port of Greno. They have done uh, a recycling of vessels uh, the last 30 years. And they started 30 years ago as a, with the focus on decommissioning the vessels. That was the core business. Then they started up having, uh, having uh, spare parts for sale and that became a bigger and bigger part of their uh, of of their company and their profit as well so today maybe only 20% of 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 their uh, budgets are actually on 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 the vessel itself the recycling their biggest part of the their company is today 80% of reselling all kinds of spare parts they have uh, maybe Europe's biggest uh, spare part uh, inventory uh, of sizes from vessels 100 meter and down, uh, all kinds of uh, 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 radars and engines and windows. You can buy everything and the internet has made it possible for them to be worldwide uh, supplier. So we want to transfer some of their knowledge within this inventory of uh, of of spare parts to to the offshore wind industry and the onshore wind industry because there are a lot of wind turbines. So it might be possible to have an, uh, a spare part site nearby Greno. So maybe the uh, 30 or 40 percent best components will be at least for 
for some ages, some, some years, to be stored for reselling. And, uh, and it also says something about that their core business today has changed from the original. So today they need to buy vessels to get spare parts before they wanted to buy vessels for recycling. If we can transfer that, it would be a big benefit on the CO2 emissions, the, the overall cost for decommissioning and so on, and also the environment for reusing of, of good components. Another uh, and another case I would like to tell you about is is a case we have right now, where we uh, where we have made an agreement with a company that used the port of Reno to sample a lot of wind turbine components. They have uh, decommissioning uh, an offshore site, taking the best components, have had contacts with various stakeholders, which has spare parts around bought a lot of spare parts and then they are right now refurbishing the cells, refurbishing the towers and blades and are building a new site in Scotland. So most of the components come from Europe, uh, main Europe land, uh, Germany and Denmark. They have been transported to, to Reno and they are refurbished. Um, we have a supply chain in Reno which can uh, support this project because we have a company called uh, Greno Diesel, like uh, the other, some of the other uh, companies in the port. They have transferred their core business from making diesel engines in the 60s, 70s and 80s to, to fishing vessels. They, uh, they built new uh, diesel engines. They, of course, also have, have had a repair shop for their own diesel engines, but today 80% of their revenue and, the, and their work is actually a repair of gearboxes for wind turbines because it is the same knowledge. So they do uh, gearbox exchanges for a lot of wind turbine owners. They have the biggest uh, spare part uh, of, of gearboxes in northern part of Europe. So a lot of turbine types they have the gearboxes at their site. So you could either call them and ask, do you have a, a refurbished gearbox? Maybe they have and they can replace it immediately and take the old one back and refurbish that one for the next client. And that's actually some of the reasons why this other company has chosen Greno as their uh, refurbished site for, for these eight turbines. And they will be, uh, they will be uh, erected in the, uh, in Scotland end of, of this year. So it's a good case. They have also brought in components that are not reused. They will be recycled instead. And can we transfer that knowledge to offshore wind as well? We can also save a lot. So, so I think for offshore wind going forward, the key word is knowledge sharing between other, on other industries to, uh, to be better and smarter. That was what I would like to show you today. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, I hope you can hear me. Thank you very much, uh, Des, for this uh, very nice presentation. I see there is a lot of same same uh, challenges uh, with Oport in in Ostend. Uh, we are really we are really. Um, uh, facing the same the same questions and the same challenges, and uh, indeed I think there will be in the in the coming years um, uh, a lack uh, of space. Space in the ports will be a big big issue. Mm -hmm. uh, also the flexibility of coming in of components etc. But a very nice presentation. Thank you very much, uh, Thais. Um, now uh, we go over to the last speaker of this session. Yes. Um, so the last, but before that we go over to the last uh, speaker, I just want to say that there is also a button on the right side of your screen where you can click on to ask some uh, questions to uh, the, the panel. Uh, the last speaker is um, um, also a Belgian one. It's uh, Karel Hermans. Karel Hermans is a senior development manager at uh, Jan de Mul. 
uh, welcome, Carl. Um, I have also a question for you. So, in the fleet of Jan de Lul, you have very, very large installation vessels like the Voltaire and uh, Les Alizés. Does it mean that Jan de Lul focus mainly on the constructions of new and large wind farms, or is decommissioning also an activity which Jan de Lul is focused on? Kyle, you have the floor. Um, an interesting question, of course. It's, it's not because we're building these big vessels that they are going to be used immediately in in, uh, in decommissioning for the offshore wind industry, obviously. Um, uh, let's hope that we're first going to build some of the newer wind farms and let's say in 25 years' time we should do, see those vessels coming back also into decommissioning. Nevertheless, it's, it's yes, uh, decommissioning is becoming a focus for us for some other reasons, which I try to explain right now. No. Um, Jan de Roel, maybe first, uh, and, and explaining where we are and, and how decommissioning is part of our business. First of all, Jan de Roel is an, uh, we call ourselves a total solution provider. Maybe we're best known to the people in this audience for, for marine works, building ports, channels, and so on, artificial islands. And also in the offshore industry, obviously, working in, in for the oil and gas industry first, but then in the last uh, 10 years, heavily switching in and then working on the energy transition towards renewables, uh, mainly in the installation of new wind farms. Besides that, we also have an, a huge civil construction department, mainly maybe active in, in Belgium, a home country. Uh, and also there we have started up an, an, a company active in circle solutions. And what do they mainly do? Well, they take care of contaminated sites, which we find both in our construction, civil construction and our marine works. And combining those two, we are already in some kind of, of recycling business, uh, decommissioning business in, in, in the civil works today, as we are also responsible for some uh, brownfield developments, so older industrial sites that we take over, we clean them up and then look for a new destination for those sites. Uh, they go very, very wide, let's say from housing, new industry, uh, and even uh, bring it back to nature. Or, or even, as you see maybe on the right side, a photo of an, an old landfill which has been changed into a solar panel um, plant in, in Belgium, still the biggest one in Belgium, uh, at 16 megawatts. Now, we are obviously a player that, that wants to be your partner in, in energy transition, and, and decommissioning is obviously a part of the energy transition. How have we worked on this? in this world map well we started and as far as i f could find back the first time we worked in offshore wind was in 2002 at the horns uh, ref1 offshore wind farm and i know there were already some older works before that but let's say that 2000 the horns ref1 is one of the bigger ones first bigger sized uh, wind farms that were built and it's only then 10 years later that we really become active as, as a construction company first in, in investing in cable installation vessels and technology. And then a couple of years later with investing in the first checkup vessels, um, for of our, and then the tire of our, and which evolved in the end in, in uh, 2019 in ordering two new vessels just to be prepared for the future as we see it. And that's the, the big vessels you mentioned, uh, Emmanuel, the Voltaire and the uh, Les Alizés. Those vessels will be ready only in 22 to build the, the next generation wind farms. But um, we will see what we do with them. Uh, this road that we took from 2002 up to now, that already uh, gave us about four, more than 40 projects in energy transition quite a lot of cable works you see still you see a big focus in europe uh, which is still the, the the center of renewable energy offshore energy but we can say that last year we already did a first job in the us a small one and we are quite busy in taiwan which is the first country besides china in the far east 
which is busy in offshore wind. And we hope to continue that, that road towards the next ones that we, we foresee like Japan and Korea and then many others to follow, we hope. Now, decommissioning for us, and, and then uh, I always use this one internally to explain uh, when we talk about decommissioning, and I'm sure it must be shown yesterday. Uh, I could not attend yesterday, but uh, Windeby for, for me is a nice example, especially if you looked up the oldest photo, black and white photo on the left, and then you see the right the photos of the decommissioning. It is exactly done almost in the same way with the same machinery and it's it's logical because because of the nature of the project it's only two to four meters deep so you have to come with shallow pontoons it's not so high 35 meters up height the weights obviously were lower you only have turbines of 500 kilowatts and you can take it down how it has been built and that's how we think uh, we have to look at, at the market so look at when it was built how it was built and most likely that will be the most economic way to get it down again in the same inverse way. Um, and you see it's 26 years lifetime. Um, that's something that, although I think it was designed for 20 years, a couple of years was that that's what we expect to see coming. Now, for us, that's important because if you look then at our fleet, um, this kind of vessels, these checkup vessels, have been typically. Uh, started and to enter the market from 2010, I would say, only. So if you would go look further, that means that these vessels should only start in the uh, decommissioning market, maybe a little bit earlier can be done, but 2035, that's a long time from now. And you see, I can, I can easily use the same slides I have to use for installation for decom, just have to change one word. Um, now, these vessels, still active today, but we foresee that in a couple of years' time, um, those vessels will become difficult to place into the new building market. We are looking at some opportunities to upgrade the vessels, to make them able to work with the newest turbines that are sold today. I'm talking about the 13, 14 megawatt turbines that are on the market, but whatever you look at this type of vessel, and some companies are, are already ordering some upgrades of the, their cranes to go higher to be able to install the, the Haliades and the Siemens 40 megawatts. But the lot will, uh, they will not be able to do this for a long time because the turbines, we foresee them uh, that they will keep on growing in, in capacity and also in height and weights, and that will make it. Uh, impossible to continue with these vessels on, on that market. Um, so within five to ten years, this kind of vessels will not be able to work on the market. And that's a problem already because you already see now, if I'm talking about decommissioning of the third, the wind farms that have been built by those vessels since 2010, more or less, it uh, those vessels will have nothing to do between five to ten years now up to 35. So there is a gap of almost 10 years in between. And that's going to be a difficult one to follow for, for those vessels to find the useful work for it. We can do some work in maintenance of the wind farms, but that's not as big as, as expected and can be done also by other vessels with much lighter uh, capacity cranes because they only have to change one blade or one gearbox at a time. Um, same for, for maybe those vessels, which we uh, partially own through our sister company, Scaldis, to deliver around this. Uh, they are quite often used in building the offshore substations. Decommissioning of the offshore substations can be done reversed way very easily by those vessels. Same for taking back the cables home, let's say. Those vessels have been installing cables, uh, inter-array export cables quite a lot. and in a reversed way, they can be taken out. We will have to unbury them. We have techniques in our dredging capacities, obviously, to unbury first the cable and then take it up on the vessel in a carousel and bring it to some port nearby. And then we have some other vessels, multi-purpose vessels, which can be used to clean up the debris of leftovers, which we always will find around 
any installation during decommission. Some things will fall in the water. Well, these vessels are already equipped with cranes that can work subsea up to even 600 meters. We don't need to go so deep, but so we are prepared for that. And in the end, um, even the scar protection can be decommissioned. So you see, we already have quite some capabilities to enter the decommissioning market. The main problem for us to see is, is what happens between the, the useful lifetime of those vessels now and when the really big decommissioning will start. And, and that's, that's the gap that will be difficult to bridge for us. That's how we see it. Now, going back to the, the big vessels, and, and that's where things are opening up for us. Um, okay, these vessels are designed, built for the next generation of wind turbines, obviously. And then and we are looking further than the 14 megawatt already with those vessels. Um, and we hope to be, let's say, that they have an economical lifetime, uh, which is a lot longer than the vessels that I have shown, shown uh, up to now. But especially, um, so we don't foresee any uh, early uh, activity of those vessels in, in decommissioning for offshore wind, but we are getting quite some interest from the decommissioning industry from the oil and gas. And, and that's what we are hoping a little bit on, that, that the decommissioning from the older and smaller oil and gas platforms can be done by our, our older vessels and a vessel like the Les Alizés, especially during the, the winter seasons when uh, wind farms are not that much into construction activities. Well, if we could fill up those gaps, that might be exactly the bridge that you need to between, let's say, the installation life of the older vessels, installation vessels, and the decommissioning uh, series one starting up after 2030. So there will be a gap to be bridged by decommissioning or other activities. So that's what we are uh, looking at. So yes, we are focusing on decommissioning, but we know that, that it's not for tomorrow yet. The big quantities uh, just look back on, on when the wind farms were built, how many turbines were there, the weights and so on. So it's going to grow slowly just as the installation was growing uh, in the past. Uh, and, and that is the bridge that we have to make with our equipment in between. And that's about it from my side, Emmanuel. Hello. Okay, uh, Kyle, can you hear? Yes. Okay. I can hear you. Okay, super. Okay, Kyle, thank you very much. A very nice presentation uh, and, and real practice presentation uh, for the future. Um, okay, thank you very much. I think I have to show my screen again. Uh, can everybody see the Q&A session? We can indeed. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, okay, so uh, now we can go over to the Q&A session. I think I have uh, time. Uh, we are ready. It's uh, half past 11. So we have maybe time for, for one or two questions. Is it okay? Yes. It is, yes. I see. Okay, I see uh, a first question uh, from uh, the audience. And it's a question to uh, Mr. Gisselbeck and Mr. Stubbe. So what are the factors that determine what the port gets selected for the decommissioning apart from the distance and who makes this decision? So I repeat the question because it's very, very small. Uh, a question to Mr. Gisselbeck and Mr. Stubbe. What are the factors or the elements that determine what the ports get selected for the decommissioning, apart from the distance, and who make this decision. Yeah, uh, Wim, can you start or, or Thais? I can start just. Uh, okay. Because as the question also mentioned, the distance has a saying, uh, and it comes back to if the decommissioning will be the same as the installation, then the installation vessel will go back and forth. If they will be decommissioned 
to barges, for instance, where a longer distance could be considered, then we think that a fewer decommissioning sites at ports is necessary. Uh, we think that the environmental aspects will be uh, quite high. We, we think that investments in infrastructure that are compliant to the environmental licenses that needs to be in place is, uh, is essential. And then, of course, an onshore supply chain that can do most of the recycling, reuse, uh, refurbishment at the port or nearby the port, as, as Wynn also showed. It should be within a distance, in my opinion, of, of five kilometers and maybe less because we will see we start with smaller components, smaller wind turbines being decommissioned. But when we will come to 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 the industry of today, looking at decommissioning 10, 15 years from now, then the com components will be so so big that we can't transport them away from the port. So everything needs to be at the port. That's our uh, predict in this. I only can uh, support this uh, viewpoint, uh, considering the fact that uh, the economic factor will also play. And um, let's say the wind park managers uh, prefer to pay as, at, as small money as possible. Um, they do not want to, uh, this is not an, uh, let's say, a major field of honor, of honor where they can have a few battles uh, to present themselves to the market. So they will reduce uh, their cost factor as much as possible. And therefore, I think I only can support the issue of uh, taste that environmental and the presence of an uh, industry which can support the decommissioning in a close uh, area around the ports uh, will be very crucial for the choice of the port. Um, the more handling uh, is needed, the more uh, costs, the more distance that needs to be transported, especially with stupid, uh, very cheap materials officially because you are transporting waste. I mean, this is still a discussion from a legal point of view, and I think Ivan will be happy to give a full expose about that, about uh, the legal status of waste. Um, I'm joking, Ivan, don't worry. Um, um, I think uh, nobody's in interested to transport waste at a high cost. So there are a few elements, and that's also the, the work within the DECOM tools project to understand how valuable the waste is and how valuable uh, the recycling process can be in order to upscale the, the costs effectiveness of decommissioning. So thank you, Thais. Okay, thank you. I see another question. Uh, I have time for two more questions and then we have to uh, stop this session. Uh, it's a question to Carl. Uh, Carl, um, do you see a different vessel rates between installation and decommissioning? Uh, getting into pricing now. I hope not, but <laughs> uh, to, to my knowledge, and I think Wim, it's a little bit like you said, nobody likes to transport waste because nobody wants to pay for waste. And, and, and uh, the pressure on pricing, if there's a huge pressure already, if, if you look at uh, vessels that have to work in uh, maintenance jobs, because there is another series of competition. Um, so yes, there, there definitely will be. Um, I'm always afraid that, that, as you said, there is no honor to be made, so they want it. There's no time pressure, so it's easier if somebody is really cheap. Does it maybe even in a not so clean way, not so safe way, it it might pass. Yes, so the pressure will be there for sure. Okay, Kyle Donovan, the last question is also for you is uh, what vessel uh, would you use for removing score protection in case score protection will uh, need to be removed in the future? Well, uh, there's several opportunities there, uh, depending on the water depth, of course. Uh, we can dredge it up if it's not too deep, and I'm not too deep, I'm talking today about 45 meters with a cutter suction dredge, and also depends on the size of the uh, score protection has been used, but let's say the most standard size can be dredged up with uh, such a cutter suction dredge. can also be done with vessels with crane capacity to bring it up. Um, 
we have done it already on smaller scales in for the oil and gas so it it, it is possible and the material can be reused the material can be reused 100 percent of course super Gentlemen, uh, so I think we are at the end of this uh, very interesting uh, discussion uh, this morning. So um, thank you very much, Kyle, Ivan, Thais and uh, Wim. Um, so I think that now there is a, a, a coffee break, but I leave it to the, the moderator of the next session. So once again, thank you very much for all these interesting presentations. Have a nice day. Bye-bye.